welcome to the Veronica Harris Show. I'm your host, Veronica Harris, and I have today my who? What are you today? Co-captain. Co-MVP? And co-host. Okay. Co-host, co-captain, co-MVP, Gregory Harris. And today is our March Madness show. Okay, we're going to be talking a little bit about the NCAA, a little bit about the history, some fun facts and trivia, and, you know, just asking some questions. We're going to test my co-pilots, my co-author, my co-MVP's knowledge on the NCAA history and see what it's all about. But first, before we get into that, I want to talk about some memories of March Madness. And I know for myself, I think, I don't know if I want to give the year when I started doing it, but I know back in the day, um, when there was Selection Sunday, before we could print out our brackets on the computer, I used to get a big uh, five-subject notebook. And I would make my brackets by hand. So I would sit in front of the TV. I mean, 6 o'clock Sunday, I would race down, sit in the basement in front of the big TV, draw my brackets out by hand, and that's how I would make my brackets. And um, I just remember doing that for a long time. I mean, for many years, all up until maybe high school. And that's we, how I did it. Were your brackets ever accurate? The year in yes, I, I they were. I mean, I took some winners. Uh oh, you know, full bracket now gets you a billion dollars. What it gets you a million? I think it gives you a million. A billion. Buffett had that challenge. Oh yeah, the Buffett. Yeah, Buffett had it, but it had to be perfect. Yeah, it had to be a perfect one. So, what were some of your memories of March Madness? Oh man, my memories is about um, watching, of course, the great teams, the Carolina teams, the Michigan teams. And also seeing those teams you didn't hear about, like the Loyola Marymounts. Right. Yeah, they were scoring like 130 points in a 40-minute college game. Mm -hmm. Just the great games. And you, you get to see everybody. You get to see the school, the big schools. You get to see the little schools, the mid-majors. That's what I remember about them. Um, right, because, time, yeah. you know, nowadays you can see what? I mean, every, almost every school is on TV at some point in time during the year. Even your school, Mount St. Mary's. You yeah, you get at least one TV game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one TV game. But like when we were young growing up, we couldn't see like uh, maybe a middle ten a Florida Gulf. No, I don't think that school was even existed. Um, like a Middle Tennessee or yeah. Valparaiso or even a Gonzaga. Or, or a MEAC team like a Howard or uh, right or Coppin yeah. State or Norfolk. We couldn't see those teams regularly, so it wasn't until the NCAA that you know we got a chance to see those teams. And that, and that gave us a, think, a thought about, well, maybe would we want to go to that school. You know, for me, like I said, when I was young and I was still running track and playing basketball, it was like, hey, I want to go to that school. Oh, I want to go to that school. Oh, I want to go to that school. Because I never heard about that school before. Mount St. Mary's, before I committed to Mount St. Mary's, that previous year they had went to the tournament. And that's how I made my decision on attending Mount St. Mary's, because I saw them in the tournament. Really? Yep. Oh, wow. Um, another one of my big uh, memories I can recall is during the games, watching it with mom, you know, well, mother, mommy, as we want to say, uh, she could never sit for a whole game. She would be like, call me the last two minutes. And me, like the little nerd that I was, with just two minutes, I go racing up the steps, mommy, mom, two minutes. And then she wouldn't come down. I'd be like, mom, it's two minutes. It's one thirty. So finally she would be like, well, call me the last two minutes. Then she would say, no, first she would say, call me the second half. Mm -hmm. Then she would say, well, now call me the last two minutes. Then she said, well, call me the last two seconds. Just tell me the highlights. <laughs> That's how she wanted to get it breaking down. And you know, those games back then, not like today where everybody's one and done and gone out of college. Mm -hmm. You had guys there three or four years. Mm -hmm. You had the Glenn Big Dog Robinsons. Mm -hmm. You had... Um, well, Chris Webb was only there for two years. Mm -hmm. But you had even like the Cliff Graham, uh, Keith Van Horn, the Tom Guglielis guys were going these magnificent runs during the tournament. It right. was really, really good basketball. So you know it was back in 1982 when Georgetown played University of North Carolina. That's where Jordan made his big splash as a freshman. You know, it was that errant pass made by Freddie Brown of Georgetown. And then um, North Carolina got the ball. And I forget who passed it to Jordan, but, you know, hit Jordan in the corner. And he hit that jumper, and then the legend was born. Yeah, Freddie Brown and Chris Webber had to time out against UNC. Right, that was 10 years later. He gave UNC another championship. Right, and that was actually 10 years later. Mm -hmm. 10 years later. But you also went to the big dance. 
Oh yeah, we got, we finally we got to the big dance. We weren't even having a great season that year, but no. you know, if you win your conference tournament, we win all those tournaments, get the automatic bid. Mm -hmm. And by being a small school, we didn't play on TV often, mm -hmm. didn't play that much. But I knew this was gonna be my chance to get on TV, playing one of those big arenas with the more than ten thousand people in the game, and all my friends and family would get a chance to see me. But the year that you actually went to the uh, big dance, as they call it, was the year that you helped Jim Phelan win that 800th uh, victory. And that was actually during the tournament time. I think it was the semifinals against Central Connecticut. No, it was the conference final, which got his 800th win. An 800th win. And yeah. you were very instrumental. And I remember, the best thing that I can remember the memories of that was that you were on ESPN, and it must have looped like, oh, my God, all throughout the night because it was showing the highlights from the different tournaments. And you had really one great highlight. When you went up under the basket, you got blocked. You got the rebound, went back up, got knocked away again. You, I mean, but you blocked kept, twice in those games. Well, you didn't get blocked, but you didn't make it. But in any words, you kept going after the rebound. You got and you finally got it. And I think it was an and one hmm. play. Yeah, I don't remember having that way. I remember getting the and one, but I don't get my shot blocked. Well, I remember you tried twice before the shot actually went in. You don't remember the dunk? You don't remember the three pointer? You remember the block shot? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I remember yeah. you had a good game. You li you literally yeah. carried the team. I had a good game that you game. You had a good game. And we uh, you know, my teammates, we all came to play. We all played really hard because you know we wanted to get to that big dance. Mm -hmm. It's all about that big dance. And um, coming off that win, they uh, they had actually a TV uh, camera c uh, crew come ride the bus with us. They did a little segment for the road to the final four. Mm -hmm. I mean, not the road to the final four, but the road to the to dance. The, right. And um, whatever segment they recorded, they didn't even, they didn't show it, right. unfortunately. But it was a, it was just a lot to do about going to the big dance. It was, and I remember uh, we rushed the court. <laughs> that was fun. That was a chance to rush the court. But um, it was, and I remember they wrote um, they wrote an article about you, and because the first thing you played Michigan State, yeah. and Mateen Cleves was there. And they were talking about who they had to stop on Mount St. Mary's. And they wrote a nice little couple paragraphs about you, about who you had to, you know, that you were the one to stop and you were the one to concentrate on. And that was really good. Michigan State ended up being the champions that year. Yeah. We, um, we faced them in the first round. We were the 16th seed. They were the one seed. They had, like, four pros on that team. Mm -hmm. They were really good. And I remember that year they had the fastest secondary break in all the college basketball. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were flying up the floor. Mm -hmm. But our coach, Milan Brown, did a fantastic job preparing us. We were able to make it a game for the first half. It was actually a ball game for the first half. I remember the score, and it was a, it was, it was a ball game. So, I, I mean, I know I wasn't there. Obviously, I wasn't playing, but I was very happy for you guys and the team, and uh, I was very, really excited. So, you know, March Madness, you know how they say that one shining moment? Mm -hmm. So I guess y'all had that one shining moment. Yeah, it was very brief. It would been nice to go uh, <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> to go uh, a few rounds deeper. I can imagine like those, those northern Illinois, whoever yeah. those Florida goes, they go all the way to the Sweet 16 mm -hmm. or something like that. But just to get our foot in the door, you know, that was very rewarding. Yeah, I, I would imagine so. So definitely with that... Um, I want to say the one shining moment that you had, but also, you know, getting into the game. Oh, you were the Chevrolet player of the game. Yes, that's what I remember, because after each game, there was always the Chevrolet player of the game from each school, and you were the Chevrolet player of the game for Mount St. Mary's. Yeah, they got to pick somebody. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, they, you know, they picked me, but, you know, my teammates, we, we, you know, we, we, we played really hard to get there. The coaches, Jim Phelan, Don Anderson, Milan Brown. They worked all hard preparing us, and, uh, you know, again, it was just good to get that for the school, okay. get back to that dance. Well, awesome. So in our next segment, we are going to talk about some fun facts and trivia, and we're going to test Gregory's, the co-pilots, the co-MVP's knowledge on some NCAA history and see how well he stacks up. So stay with us, and we'll be right back. Taught him how to hit a baseball. How to hit a receiver. The strike zone. The net. You taught him how to hit the upper corner. You even taught him how to hit the open man.
How much time have you spent teaching him what not to hit? Morning, Gary. We are GetSchooled.com. You want a college education, don't you? You know you do. That's why we're here. We're free and here to guide you through every step of the way, starting with attendance. <laughs> Gary, financial aid forms. Picking a college, man. You and us we go together like tacos and Tuesday. And I love tacos. Go to GetSchooled.com. I have troll teeth. That my voice sounded like a possessed baby doll. That no one would ever love someone as stupid as me. That I was fat. Ugly. Disgusting. The effect of bullying is potent. We will no longer be the silent majority. Now, when you see online bullying, there's something you can do about it. We're going to take action with the eye. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness, and so are you. Veronica Harris show. I'm your host, Veronica Harris, and co-host, co-pilot, co-MVP. Little brother. What's your name? Gregory Harris. You know my name. <laughs> okay, well, now we're going to talk about uh, some fun facts and some trivia about the NCAA. In case you didn't know, the NCAA tournament, or the big dance, as they call it, well, when we were growing up, it started out with, well, believe it or not, it actually started out with um, the field began growing to 16 teams from 1951 to 1952, but it started out with just eight teams, eight teams back in 1939. Uh, that I didn't know. Right. It started out with eight teams back in 1939 until finally, how many teams do we have now? 69? 68. 60, okay. But you know, they said back then... The NCAA was second fiddle to the NIT. Yes, it was. Now it was the other way around. It was second fiddle to the NIT, and actually it was Al McGuire of Marquette. He actually turned down um, an invitation to the NCAA because he wanted to go play in the NIT, I believe it was. And then the NCAA, in typical NCAA fashion, made it against the rules. Like you could be banned from postseason play if you turned down one of their um, invitations. But they went to court over that, and they sued. Um, it was an antitrust lawsuit, and the NCAA um, ended up buying the NIT. So now that's considered the consolation, the consolation prize. So yeah, that was really um, that's really uh, the NCAA man. They were just some gangsters. All about that money. <laughs> it's all about that money. But let's talk about some more history. So back in 1966, all right, that was a pretty. Inf um, important or a, a pivotal year, or you could say a watershed year, because up until then, it was thought uh, that you could not start or did not start an all-black starting lineup. Now, even though the players were good, and there was a lot of, trust me, we've had a lot of good basketball players of all, of all nationalities, but primarily, you know, African Americans were the ones that dominated the sport of basketball, but you would never put together a, a starting five. You could have maybe two on the court, three on the court, maybe one on the court, but never all five. But it wasn't until Texas Western, now called UTEP, that they put an all-black starting five against Adolf Rupp's all-white. Now, they didn't have a black person on the team, but it was an all-white starting lineup. And guess who else was on that team? Guard. Pat Riley. Pat Riley was Pat on that Riley team person. at that time. So that was pretty interesting. And they went on to win the NCAA championship. And... It still was a couple years after that. It was still a couple years after that, but Adolph Rupp finally decided to start recruiting, um, not recruiting, but playing, you know, more black players on his team. He did have black players, but he wasn't playing them, like, together, as they were. But you know what movie was based off that story? Glory Road. Glory Road, okay. Well, yeah. Thank you picking up on something. You picking up on something. I didn't see the movie Glory Road. You should have saw Derek Luke was in there. He was very good. But um, yeah, back to those all-black starting five. I mean, you had to be real courageous as a coach to cross that line and, and, and to play your best five instead of what, you know, the pressure you're getting from boosters or, or from administration and that sort of thing. Um, 
because blacks were starting to, you know, get into the game. Of course, you had Bill Russell, they had Will Chamberlain playing around this time. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew how, how talented, you know, the African-American players were. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it just, took, it just took a matter of time before somebody crossed that line and then, you know, a lot, a lot more followed. Right, absolutely. So as we always want to know, well, who does the most? Because we always want to know, well, who's won the most, who won the least? But which team currently still has the most NCAA titles? That would be UCLA. And how many titles do they have? Uh, 11 or 12, I'm not sure. 11. 11, okay. 11 titles, okay. yes, they do. And 10 were won by John Wooden. But believe it or not, back then they didn't have to win as many games. Like now you have to win six games. Mm -hmm. In order to make it all the way, or to win the whole thing, but then you didn't have you didn't have as many rounds in the tournament. So I'm not saying the ten is nothing to sneeze at, but it was just a little bit different at the time when John Wooden was winning, mm -hmm. as opposed to now. So which brings us to John Wooden UCLA, the Lou Alcindor rule. Have you ever heard about the Lou Alcindor rule? Man, about Lou Alcindor though, he lost one game in high school. Mm -hmm. Lost two games in college. Mm. He must have been the, he must have had the best winning percentage as a player. As a player of anybody. Okay. Well, yeah, he might have. For his basketball career, talking about from middle school all the way through the pros. I mean, he was awesome. Well, Lou Alcindor. He lose two games in college. Well, can, we two. well can we finish? Bad Lou Al boy. Lou Al Bad can boy. we finish? Oh. Lou Alcindor, aka Kareem Abdul Jabbar of UCLA. We was preparing to dunk over Dayton's Dan Seidler, sadlier, in the 1967 NCAA championship game. After that, the dunk was banned from college basketball the following season, and it remained outlawed until the 1976-77 season. And that information comes from um, the NCAA News, Icar Ar NCAA News Archive, <laughs> and the, the document is called Chronicle of the Jam. Because we always like to get our information, you know, we do research and get mm -hmm. our facts straight, but that's where we got it from. So, John Wooden was, went on to tell Lou Alcindor that he really think it wasn't about him personally, but what happened is that um, that, particular, that particular rule forced Lou Alcindor to develop his now famous what? Hook shot. Sky hook. Yeah, the, hook, the sky hook, hook shot. Still the hook shot. But right. yeah, the sky hook. Well, because up until then... To be more correct, sky hook. Thank you very much. Because up until then, basically, Kareem was just, you know, turning, dunking, and, you know, nobody could really stop him. But by had not having that shot available to him anymore, forced him to work on his footwork and develop that now unstoppable, you know, sky hook. Yeah, Kareem was dominating, you know, with the dunk shot. And um, like you said, it wasn't just about Kareem because when they got those all f five blacks on the floor, they were attacking the rim with such ferocity that, you know, and the white guys couldn't do that. that a lot of people say that's why they changed the rule after that all black starting five just continuously attacked the rim uh, with the dunk shot. And I remember there was a scene in Glory Road where I forget what the character's name was, but he dunked in a game. And they called, like, a technical foul on him. You know, they, they wanted to eject him from the game, if I'm not mistaken. I have to watch the movie again, but the dunk was not seen as the, a shot to have. It was seen, it was seen as more of, like, uh, not a good thing. And was there some racial context involved? I would think so, because who was doing the dunking at the time? I mean, it's not just two points. It's, 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 a, it's a punch in the mouth. Yeah, it's a punch, but who, a punch but in the who mouth. But who was doing the dunking at the time? Primarily, which athletes? The Negroes. All right, then. There it is. All right. So we have a couple more questions to ask you. So in 1984, I know you weren't born yet. No, you were born yet. I was born. Uh, okay, forget it. Well, you was really young. But 1984, Georgetown, led by Patrick Ewing, won their first national championship. Ah, and John Thompson was the first black uh, coach to win an NCAA title game. But anyway, which school did they defeat 84-75 to 75 in the championship game? In 1984, I was six, and that's when I got my first basketball and started following basketball. Okay, well, who won the game? Georgetown won the game. Right, but who did they beat? They, they beat Houston Rockets. Houston Rockets? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the University of Houston. Five Slammer. With that Five Slammer Jammer mark. Right. Exactly. And then the great Hakeem Olajuwon. And? Clyde Drexler. All right, then. 
And so also the next year, Georgetown went back to the finals. Because believe it or not, Georgetown went to the finals in 82. They went back in 84. And then they went in 85. But the next year, Georgetown lost to which school in the finals? They lost to Villanova. Very good. They watched yeah. Villanova. Now, here's another question. And you probably like know this a lot. And a lot of basketball players might really know. Not basketball players, but basketball uh, fans might really know this question. So in 1992, the East Regional Final, Christian Leitner hit the... You ever see that 30 for 30, I hate Christian Leitner? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's funny. So anyway, in the 1992 East Regional Final, Christian Leitner hit the game-winning basket from the top of the key with one second left to lift Duke 104 to 103. Uh, the 104-103 victory. Which team was their opponent? That was Kentucky. That was Kentucky. Very good. Paul Mashburn on that mob. I believe Tony Delk was on that mob. And the thing about that game, Christian Leitner was perfect. Meaning, so explain that to us. 10 for 10 from the field, mm -hmm. 10 for 10 from the free throw line, 30 points. I okay. don't think that's ever been done or ever will be done again. All right, and then we have one more question. We'll try to squeeze this in. So UCLA has the most championships with 11 titles. Which school is in second place, and how many titles has the school won? Oh, man, the Blue States, that's Kentucky. Right. Kentucky has eight. All right, very good. How about for you? All right, I believe you're three for three on that. Okay, so that concludes our section of the fun facts and trivia about the NCAA. And if you know some fun facts or trivia um, as the March Madness comes up, you're going to have a chance to write to us and email us, but we will tell you about that in our next segment, our last segment, which is What is Veronica Thinking? And we will be right back with that. My name is Kyra Stewart. I'm a board member of the Woodridge Warriors Youth Organization. But more importantly, I'm a parent. Woodridge was established as a community-based organization in 1963. 49 years later, we continue to thrive as a nonprofit, offering mentoring and sports services to Washington area boys and girls aged 5 to 15. Our kids have year-round sports options, including playing football, basketball, baseball, and cheering. Woodridge has a committed group of experienced coaches and dedicated volunteers working to make every child better. We welcome players at all levels with a focused approach that moves young athletes from beginner to experienced and finally advanced. We've seen our players go on to play in college and professionally, but more importantly, they go on to become successful men and women. The Woodridge community is dedicated to positive youth development. Come and play with us. Did you know that a study by the National Center for Education Statistics shows that 50% of recent college graduates have student loans with an average student loan debt of $10,000? Since the cost of college tuition is increasing every year, it is difficult to get financial aid without getting student loans. So if you have student loans, here are some ways to pay off student loan debt. Some student loans allow you to make payments prior to graduation. Use some of the money you make during school or during the summer to pay down the loan. This reduces the interest that accrues on your loan. Consolidating some student loans may increase your interest rate and the total amount owed over the life of the loan. Do extensive research before deciding to consolidate your loans. You may not be eligible for certain programs such as forbearance, deferment, or loan forgiveness if you consolidate. You are eligible for the Student Loan Forgiveness Program if you work for the Federal Government, Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, or in the military, medical field, law enforcement, teacher, or work in low-income areas. Visit www.fin AID.com for more information. Protect your credit. If your loans go into default, you are at risk of having your paycheck garnished, having your tax refund taken, or your account being forwarded to a collection agency and reported on your credit report. Federal loans have several programs to help you pay back your debt, some of which are based on your income. 
going to college will allow you to earn up to an additional $1 million over your career. So be smart about how you will pay back your student loans. DCTV and H.E. Freeman Enterprises are pleased to bring you information that keeps you and your family in the know. For more information, visit dctv.org and click on In the Know. segment of the Veronica Harris show and it's always entitled what is Veronica thinking and today I'm thinking about the importance of networking and building professional relationships in life you're going to have different types of relationships you have your personal relationships your family relationships and your work relationships but you cannot discount the importance of networking and building those personal relationships because that is how you're going to get to meet people you're going to get to know people and you're going to get to meet people that are like-minded are like-minded so people that are doing the same things that you are doing. And if you're talking to those type of people, those people can also help you further your career. And not only can they help you, but you can also help them. And sometimes by helping others, that's when you really help yourself. You want to add anything to that, Reverend? When I was contemplating maybe getting into coaching, um, trying to see what the next steps, talking to a few guys into coaching and seeing what I should do, they talked about going down to the Final Four. The March Madness, the big tournament. That's where everybody congregated it at at that time of year. And like you said, network, build those relationships, those professional relationships. And that's how a lot of people get their jobs. You know, because like they say, it's not what you know, but who you know. Who you know. So in other words, to know somebody, you got to go meet somebody. Mm -hmm. So you should go to these conferences. So if you are in your professional career right now, and there are organizations for you to join, like professional organizations, take the time. Join them. If they're free, that's even better. If not, invest in yourself because that's the best place you can put your money because that will always return big dividends. Buy that plane ticket, pay for that spring for that hotel, put your face in the place. All right. So that's what Veronica thinking. And you can always tell us what you're thinking by e emailing us at what is Veronica thinking. That is all one word. What is Veronica thinking at gmail.com. We look forward to your comments, questions. And you never know, maybe your comments, questions, or show ideas may end up right here on the Veronica Harris Show. So thank you again for watching us and listening to us or however you come about us. But we're always appreciative and we look forward to seeing you again soon.